We're going to see how long Kevin can hold that last note, weren't we? You know, is it bad that I almost lost my Christian witness driving over here when some guy cut me off? Don't you know I'm the pastor? I have to get to the church. Let's pray together. At least I need it. Perhaps you do as well. God, we're grateful to be here together. And we know because your word has told us that it's living and active. We ask you now, Lord Jesus, who are the living word made flesh, to speak to us through your written word. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Well, as you saw in the little bumper video there, we're beginning a brand new series on the book of James. I get excited when we begin new series. I get excited when we end series. I get excited in the middle of series, but particularly for James, I'm very excited about this summer. It's a time when people come and go. Perhaps you've got travel plans throughout the summer, and so that James is a unique book because while it's a unified whole, obviously, it also, each portion kind of stands alone. We encourage you, however, to track along with us throughout the summer. And I want to tell you a couple ways you can do that. Of course, all of our sermons are available online or on the church app on Monday after we preach them. So from any campus, you can hear them. Easy to share as well. There's a share button. You can share them with friends or family if you think it would be encouraging to them. Additionally, we're providing study notes to go along with James. Notes about the commentary and history of the, of the book itself and of the content of the letter. And those will be available on the church app. As well as for those of you who like to do things digitally, you can take notes. I like to use actual pen and paper. I know I'm kind of a dinosaur that way. But for those of you who like to type your notes, you can do that also on the app. So you could have on your app your own notes for each sermon, the study notes provided for you for each sermon, and the sermon itself. We hope that's an encouragement to you and a way for you to engage with what we're learning as we go throughout the summer. But let's talk about James a little bit. It's one of the shorter books in all of the New Testament, like most of the New Testament. It's a letter written by James. Um, we'll talk about who it's written to in a moment. It's one of the earliest letters, perhaps with the exception of Galatians, but probably one of the, er the earliest letter written of the New Testament. Uh, Mark is the earliest gospel, but James was written before Mark, maybe 20 years before, somewhere between 45 and 49 AD. So a very early letter. There are several people named James in the New Testament. You might be thinking of James, the, the brother of John, they were sons of Zebedee. Jesus called them the sons of thunder. That's a pretty good nickname. If you're going to get a nickname from Jesus, that's not bad. The son of thunder. This is not that James. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote this letter. Think about that. He grew up with Jesus. The son of God was his half-brother. That's pretty remarkable. I wonder what that was like for James. I've been thinking about that. Uh, this James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. We'll talk about that later. And it appears to us uh, from the biblical record that James, this James, the author of the letter, was not a follower or a believer in Jesus during Jesus' earthly lifetime. He, in fact, in John chapter 7, we read about uh, Jesus' brothers and family come to him in, in a synagogue in Galilee, and they say, stop saying this crazy stuff. It's bad for the family reputation. This is my paraphrase, right? And they tell him to leave. And then the last, verse 5 of John chapter 7 is, even his own brothers did not believe in him. But then something happens to James. After Jesus dies and is raised from the dead, the risen Jesus appears to James in 1 Corinthians. We're told about this. And now something changes for James. James has come to believe that his half-brother is the Lord of all creation. The God of heaven and earth. How many of you have siblings? Show of hands. What would it take for you to come to believe that your brother or sister was Lord of heaven and earth? <laughs> Some of you are going, it would be impossible, Pastor. You don't know my brother, right? <laughs> to, to bow down and worship them and confess with your mouth and with your life that they are all powerful. That they're God in the flesh. I have two sisters. One of them attends our church at the Kessler campus. I think she probably would tell you, well, he thought he was Lord of heaven and earth. <laughs> but I would... But she would disagree, and she'd be right. James comes to see that the boy he grew up with, Jesus, is God himself. He gives his whole life to serving him and to building his church. James the skeptic becomes a sold-out believer and leader because of an encounter with the risen Christ. On that level, we can all relate to him. Let's open and read James chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. You can follow with me in your own Bible or on the screen. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in dispersion, greetings. I like James because Paul says things like grace and peace to you and our Lord and Savior. He just says, James, a slave of Jesus, greetings. He's very direct. Verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know 
But the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now there's a lot in there. We won't probably get through all of it in detail, but we'll try. Uh, as I said, James calls himself a servant of God of the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses the Greek word doulos for servant, which can be translated slave. Some of you will know this is not like chattel slavery in America. That word for slave is referring to a bond servant, someone who willingly, willingly subjects themselves to another person's will. This was done if you owed a debt, I become your bond servant until the debt's paid off, or for, often for some people who were in very serious crisis and starving would surrender themselves to somebody of wealth to become their, their bond servant in order to provide for their family. So James is saying, I am the willing, surrendered servant of Jesus. Think about that. He doesn't say, James, the half-brother of Jesus. He says, James, the willing slave of Jesus. Greetings, he says. And then he says, to the 12 tribes in dispersion. This is, the 12 tribes, most of you will know, is a Jewish or Hebrew reference to the Israelites. The descendants of the 12 tribes, the Jews by culture and birth, who are in dispersion, meaning they're now scattered or dispersed. In Acts chapter 7, there's a story of the stoning of a man named Stephen. And Stephen gives this great, he's one of the early leaders of the church, gives this speech, long speech, beautiful speech, you can read it in Acts 7, where he pretty much, <laughs> with no uncertain terms, calls the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, snakes, scoundrels, evil and wicked, and they killed God himself. They, not surprisingly, don't like this very much, and stone him to death. His death is the first martyr of the church, and it sparks this really intense persecution. If you could skip ahead one slide, the one to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. We'll go back to that one. I know I'm out of order. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Oop, nope, Acts 8, 1. You're way ahead of me. Well, I'll read it. Acts 8, verse 1. If you can find Acts 8, 1. I think it's the second slide, one, one ahead of where you were. And Saul approved of his execution. This is Saul becomes Paul, uh, 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 who wrote most of the New Testament. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the stoning of Stephen leads to this massive persecution. Saul is there giving approval, probably ordering it. And now he's pursuing Christians in their homes and all around Jerusalem and Judea. And so these believers, these Jewish Converts to faith in Christ as the Messiah flee for their lives. They scatter, they disperse. The 12 tribes in dispersion. James writes to them this letter. Now, unlike Paul, James spends no time at all in his letter, almost zero effort in defining theological terms, in dealing with difficult doctrines. He doesn't talk about the atonement or the meaning of the cross. He kind of assumes you know all that. His primary concern is how you live. His driving concern to these scattered Christians is, okay, you believe in Jesus the Christ, that he died for the sins of yours in the world. What difference does that make in your life? That's why we're calling it street-level faith. What difference does your faith make in your home, on your street, in your life, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak? That's what James cares about. And in this section, he's talking about that in trial. What difference does your faith make when life is really hard? What does it look like to be faithful when you're being persecuted, 
when you have disappointment, when you have loss. This is what we all face. I know I'm going backwards. I just want to challenge the slide operator today. What we all face. From beginning to end, is what we all face. Go back one. What we all face is trials. James says trials of various kinds. He doesn't say where they come from or what causes them or what kind they are. He just says of various kinds. And from beginning to end, the Bible is clear. If you belong to Jesus, you do not get a pass on suffering. Religious people don't have like a force field around them where they're impervious to pain. That's clear throughout the scriptures. Job 5, verse 7, Job says, Man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. It's part of life. And you all know that. And if you don't know that yet, just give it time. Life is hard. We experience difficulty and pain and sorrow and grief and loss. Nobody is immune. This is not new news. James is saying we all face trials of various kinds. He doesn't say if. He says when. Let me read verses 1 and 2 for you again. James. James, the servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What a statement to start with. To people running for their lives, leaving businesses and homes. This is not that shocking for people living in the ancient world to say you face trials. It's actually not that shocking for people living in most of the world today. If you've traveled outside of the comfortable suburban world that we live in, you know much of the world, they face hardships on a daily basis that if they were come to us even one time, most of us would be undone. We live a very comfortable, secure existence here. And to most people, in most of human history, to say life is hard is kind of like, duh. Tell me something I don't know. But I, I think we are living in perhaps the worst society in human history at preparing people for suffering. You think that's true? I think American suburban culture particularly, but American culture is perhaps the worst in human history in terms of helping people deal with the reality of pain and suffering. Because we have whole industries designed to relieve suffering, to get rid of it, to ignore it, to anesthetize it. And the prevailing worldview in our culture today is what you might call a secular materialist worldview. It's not the only worldview, there are competing worldviews, but it's the prevailing one. Meaning, this life is all that there is, and if there's a life beyond this life, we don't really know what that is. And so, if this life is all there is, if you only go around once, then the joy and the fulfillment and the peace and the prosperity you experience in this life are ultimate, because there's nothing after. So, the, by, by, by inverse reasoning, the joy and peace and prosperity that you lose in this life, you lose ultimately. See, this is why people are clinging to things in our culture. It's all they get. It's all they have. For most of human history, not just Christians, but human beings in general have sort of lived with the understanding that this life is not all there is. And so the joy and prosperity and peace that I might lose in this life, while painful and difficult, and oftentimes even unjust, is an ultimate loss. It's not. There's something beyond this life. How we face it then. What we face, we all face trials of various kinds. That's not unique. But what's unique is James is telling us how we face it. Let me read verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, when he says perfect and complete, we think without flaw or defect. Unless applied to God, that's not primarily what the Bible authors mean by perfect. They don't mean without fault. They mean whole, complete, lacking nothing, he says. Like uh, integers versus fractions. Whole numbers versus fractions. Integer comes from the root word for the word integrity. Living a whole life, a life that's in unison. Meaning I'm, most of us live fractured lives. Most of us live lives that to one degree or another are not in line with what we say we believe. Would that be true of you? Do you live beneath the level of your stated convictions? Or do you always live up to your faith? We, most of us live lives that are inconsistent, sometimes hypocritical, fractured. James is saying trials, if seen accurately, can actually make you a whole person. Can actually deepen you. Deepen your faith. 
make you whole, which sounds counterintuitive in our culture. And let me, let me read to you now, or explain to you the th- three Greek words that come out of these three verses, two through four, which I think will be helpful. When he says count it, your Bible might say consider. Count it all joy. That's the Greek word hegeomai. It means to reckon or account for. It comes from the practice of accounting. To put on the right side of a ledger, literally, is what it means. It means to look at your pain, think deeply about it, and put it in its proper place. To account for it properly. That's really important that you understand that. When he says count it all joy, he's not saying you should be happy for all the terrible things in life. He's saying when you can put it in its proper place, there's actually a measure of deep joy there and hope. It's not a kind of masochism he's advocating for. Just, be, just smile at all the pain. He's saying think, reckon, account for it in its proper place. We'll come back to that. And then he says in verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. No is the Greek word gnosko. It means knowledge born from experience. It means you, you've lived this. So James is saying, when you face pain and difficulty and trial, stop, think, put that trial in its proper place, for you know by experience what God can do. And then the, then the word testing, the testing of your faith, that's the word, Greek word dokimion, it comes from the root word, which was, refers to how the process of refining silver and gold through fire, burning off the slag, the dross, to refine gold or silver. So think about what James is saying here. My brothers and sisters who are in, in difficulty, scattering, running for your life in persecution, facing trials of all kinds, stop, think, put that trial in its proper place, eternally speaking. Account for it rightly. From God's point of view. For you know what God can do. And he is doing something, refining you at a level that, while painful, is going to produce something in you. I, I've, this is what 1 Peter 1, 7 means when it says, These have, trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed using the exact same imagery and words there. James is saying, put suffering in its proper place. And I, I, as a pastor, I know that you have seen this as well. When you are around somebody who has a very deep and genuine faith, can you tell? Is it palpable? Yes or no? How? It's hard to put into words, isn't it? But you can feel it from them. The way they talk, the way they pray, the way they refer to God, the way they listen. You've been around somebody who has a deep faith. It's, they've been through some stuff. They've been through the fire, and they've come out the other side, deeper, refined, of a faith more precious than gold. On the other hand, I've seen people, and I know people who no longer attend here, who faced horrible things in their life, and they just walked. They just said, I can't reconcile this with my understanding of God, and therefore I'm, I'm done. Faith, trials can derail or deepen your faith. James is calling us to deepen when he says this. Let me read verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now that sounds like, well, first of all, it sounds like he's changing the subject, right? Trials, now wisdom. But they're related because he's talking about if you cannot count it joy, if you cannot put it in its proper place, if you're just struggling mightily with the goodness of God in the midst of this trial, what should you do? Walk or seek wisdom? He's saying when you can't on your own think your way out of this, ask God for wisdom. I talked to a woman last night who's in the middle of a trial, and she says, I don't really trust God, but I want to want to. That's a great place to begin. I want to want to. We'll start with that prayer, asking God. Now, it also sounds like he's saying that if you doubt, God goes, if any question creeps into your mind when you ask God for wisdom, God goes, la, 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 I'm not listening to your prayers anymore, right? Like any existential doubt. 
That's not what he's saying. We hear the word doubt, we think of psychological uncertainty. That's not what the biblical author means by doubt. Because that kind of doubt, having questions about what are you doing, God? Where are you, God? I don't understand why this is happening, God. We all have those. The psalmist wrote about those. The psalms are full of those kind of doubts and questions. Thomas is nicknamed what? Doubting Thomas. Not as good as Son of Thunder. We don't have a nickname. Doubting Thomas. And if doubting is wrong, when, he show, when Jesus shows up, he doesn't zap him and kill him for having questions. He says, touch me and see. So psychological uncertainty, questions about what God's will is, are not sinful or wrong. And that's not what James is referring to. He, the word doubt means, he refer, it's translated later in verse 8 as double-minded. It literally means dual allegiances. What he's saying is this. You're facing hardship and pain. And maybe it's unjust and you didn't ask for it or cause it. And you can't understand why God would allow it or what good could possibly come from it. Can you, while in that reality, hold on to, at the deepest level of your soul, belief that God is still there and belief that God is still good? Like, like Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Can you hold those two things in tension? That's what he means by doubt. Dual allegiances. Not that I have any questions at all. Of course you do. We all do. Let me, let, me, let me pause for a little aside here. I think it's important that, so you know what, what James is not saying. When you, when you hear the phrase, count it all joy, I, I, I know that for some people you're thinking, well, wait a second, time out. All suffering, all evil, all wickedness, all pain, all trial is joy? How's that possible? I mean, we, we're living in a cultural moment where almost every week we hear another story, a Me Too story about a woman who was abused by a man in power. Are we to count those joy? Is James saying, yes, count it all joy. That's ridiculous. That's terrible if that's true. No, absolutely not, is the answer. Jesus was against injustice. We stand against the oppressed, and against the, the, the oppressors and for the oppressed. We stand with the vulnerable. We are to fight injustice in the world. We are to call things wicked that are evil and sinful. And in your own life, you may experience things that are painful and unjust and evil caused by somebody else's sin. You don't have to rejoice over their sin. But what he's saying is in your life, can you on the one hand acknowledge this is wrong and it hurts and still recognize that my God is greater and still recognize that even though I can't see it, even though I don't yet experience it, God could bring something out of it. Look at the cross behind me for a minute. I can't tell if you look at the cross because you're looking straight ahead, but, you know, look at the cross. Isn't the cross the symbol of, the ultimate symbol of this reality? It is evil, instrument of torture. It was wicked that men put the Son of God to death. He was innocent and not deserving of it. And yet inside of God's will, it was allowed to happen, and God brought something out of it for the redemption of the world, for the salvation of your soul and mine. So James is not saying we just pretend everything's fine or we smile at horrible things or we ignore them. Of course we fight for justice. And he'll get to that later when he talks about partiality and justice. But he's saying, while we acknowledge this is wrong and wicked and hurtful and painful, we also trust that God is greater. And he can, ultimately speaking, refine me through it in a way that deepens me, grows me. Helps me fall more intimately in love with him. Okay, I, I don't know where I am in my notes. Let me read verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. There's a lot in here we don't have time to go through. And James gives a little beautiful little anatomy of temptation and sin and how it grows and, and is conceived. And we don't have time to unpack all that. Basically, what James is saying is this. When you face trials and you're in pain, you're going to face the temptation to blame God. Don't. Don't accuse God. And really what he's saying is you can either view your trials, your present trials, 
through the lens of our good God, or you can see it the other way. You can question the goodness of God through the lens of your present pain and trial. That's, it really comes down to this. But I forgot where I left it. When you face trials, you really have a choice. You can either look through the goodness of God at your trial or look through your trial and question the goodness of God. I bought these binoculars last night at Walmart just for this illustration. When you look in binoculars, things that are far away appear what? Oh, right? <laughs> Closer. So if, James is saying if, you, if you, faith accurately brings God closer to you, helps you see that he's closer to you than you realize. That, as Paul says, he's closer to you than you are to yourself. He is near to the brokenhearted. He is not far from any one of you. That's how faith works when it's accurate. But here's what most of us do when we face trials. We do this. In addition to making you cross-eyed, what does this do? It makes things that are close feel what? Far away. Most of us look through our pain at God and go, he seems so distant. He seems so far away. He seems so unconcerned. I can barely see, where is he? This is the choice James is saying. This is why he says to us later, don't be deceived. Looking backwards, right? The eyes of faith bring God closer to you in your trial. He says you can trust that he's doing something which you cannot yet see. Last, who we face it with. So what we face, we all face trials. How we face them, we face them through the eyes of faith. And, and, and at this last point, if you boil it all down, I think most of us, what we need in trials is not a theological lesson. We don't need religious platitudes. We need to know we're not alone. We need to know that we're not abandoned. Listen to what James says here in verses 16 through 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That phrase, do not be deceived. You know, James can be a very direct and harsh guy. You're going to see later on in the letter, he does not mix words. He gets in our spiritual faces, so to speak. But I love this verse 16. It's very tender and compassionate. He says to his beloved, his brothers and sisters who he loves, who are fleeing, he says, don't be deceived. I'm going to read this to you in different ways. I want you to hear it. Beloved brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. God is still good. Beloved brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. You are not alone. Beloved brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. God has not abandoned you. He's still at work in your life. His purposes are still true. Beloved brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. Don't run from God. Run to him. That's it, isn't it? You can either run from God or you can run to God when you're in pain. And I see both happen all the time. Years ago, I was in Target, and because I'm a little taller than average, I could see over the, the rack of whatever I was shopping for, and I saw the forehead and eyes of a man that I recognized, who I had not seen in church in a long time, and I know it's because he's going through some stuff. And he looked up and he saw me, and he saw that he saw me, and I saw that he saw that I saw him. You know, it was like this moment, you know? And then he did this. You know, and ordinarily I would, I don't want to bother him, I would, I would just walk away. But I just felt the spirit nudge me. I walked over to him and I just said this, hey, listen, no shame. I've been praying for you. I miss you. You're welcome back anytime. And I just left. He's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like you had the pastor guilt. I wasn't in church kind of thing going. Two months later, he showed up and we had coffee after that. And he said, that was exactly what I needed to hear because I'd been running from God. How do people run from God? Like, how do you, if he's omnipresent, how do you actually run from him? I, I'd suggest three ways. We run, we, we run by we, from his word. We stop trusting and reading and meditating on his word. We run from prayer. We stop speaking our hearts to him and listening in our hearts to him. And we run from his people. We run from the community of faith. We stop showing up. I think it's true about human hearts 
that we have a tendency to run away from the things we most need when we most need them. Don't you think that's true? You most need the community of faith to encourage you and to pray for you and support you, and yet you avoid it when you're hurting. You most need the word of God to speak truth to your heart, but sometimes we avoid it when we're hurting. We most need to cry out and pray to God and hear him speak to us, but we stop that when we're hurting. I think James is saying, don't run. Don't be deceived. Don't run away from God. Run to him. He's still good. He's still there. He's not abandoned you. Don't be deceived. And in your deception, run away from God. Don't run from the thing you need most. Let me just close by sharing with you uh, an experience I had with my wife. We were in Zambia, Africa. Uh, we got to visit a Cure hospital. Cure is a ministry that's building first world hospitals in third world developing countries. They're bringing what would be ordinary surgeries to us, which are really acts of miraculous grace to many of these children. Uh, and, and in this hospital, there's these moms and some dads who have traveled, some of them hundreds of miles, many on foot, for days, weeks, to bring their child to this hospital in the hopes that they could wait and eventually have a life-altering surgery for their son or daughter. And they don't have money. The surgeries are free if they can get in and qualify. And these moms and dads don't have, there's no hotels in the bush. They don't have any place to go. They sleep on the hard tile floor next to the bed of their son or daughter or niece or nephew for days and days and days, hoping, praying that their child will get the surgery they need. In many ways, it's a really hard place to visit because suffering children is just hard. But in other ways, it's a beautiful place. One of the ways God showed me that, I mean, th these are hardships these, these families in Zambia are experiencing that are just foreign to us. If they were to come into your life or mine, it would undo most of us. And every morning and every evening on the children's ward, these parents begin the day and end the day in praise. They sing these songs of praise. And let me tell you, I just want to show you a little clip from one of those. This is an evening prayer and praise session. Well. <laughs> singing in the language called Nyanja. I can say a few phrases in Nyanja. Would you like to hear them? I can say, I love you, my wife. Nikukonda Makaziwanga. I can say, I am hungry. Nafa Njala. That's about it. That phrase in that song, Untale Amumbondeye, means my Lord is always with me. That's the refrain in that song. My God is always with me. My Lord is always with me. And the, the verses, I don't know them, but they're talking about when I face this, when I face this, when this happens, my God is always with me. My God is always with me. That little boy coming down the hall, did you see him in a wheelchair? His name in Nyanja means gift. He had two club feet and two dislocated hips. Not a big deal in our culture if you're born with that. The corrective surgery is pretty easy. But it's a miracle in rural Zambia. He was a, considered cursed in his village by God. And now he's going to walk. Now he's a walking miracle. Just being with those people, right? James says what? Consider it joy when you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith is doing something in you that will refine you and help you come to know and love God in a way you couldn't otherwise. Yes, it's wicked and evil, and suffering exists in the world, and we fight against that. We also believe our God is greater. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this ancient letter which speaks such relevant truth to our hearts. We all face our own trials at different times, and we all are tempted to walk away, to doubt your goodness, to avoid the community of faith. And my God, I just pray by your grace and your spirit that you would help us not to be deceived, that we would not run from you, but we would run straight to you. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake.
Amen.